Okay guys, drywall is coming. Dry Next video you see the whole house. The whole, you guys gonna get sick? Are you gonna get sick? The whole house, ooh, I'm gonna get sick. The whole house is gonna be drywalled in. Hey, future Mike here. Realized I didn't say, hey, how's it going? Hope you've been well. So I do hope you've been well. Here we are in the garage. I've been hard at work, busy as a bee. All the drywalls in, as you can see, working on kind of getting closets and cabinets in, vanities, and started building out the little pantry, kitchen, flooring. So lots happened since the installation video. So I'm gonna do an update video very soon and really I'm just filming because I wanted to say, hey, how's it going? Hope you've been well. So yeah, you'll see more of this soon. Thanks for watching and back to installation. Uh, but this video is not about drywall. This video is about comfort. This video is about quietness. This video is about safety. This video is, well, I don't know. This is, <laughs> I'm gonna be largely talking about insulation, what I used on my home, kind of some of the design cues, the, the goals of this build that I had. And yeah, I just wanted to talk about it because I think it's really cool, really nerding out about all this stuff. So in the home, I used a few products here. Some is, turn this, I'm turn my camera sideways here. Some of it is this Rockwool Comfort Bat R15. This is for, you can see on here, it gives a lot of, a lot of information. This is for two by four walls. And then I use Safe and Sound. This is for 24 inch on center. Uh, they also make it 16 inch. They make it in all your standard sizes and they do make a thicker one greater than R15. I'm not sure what it is, but for two by six walls. If you've been following the build at all, you know all my exterior walls are two by six walls, 16 inch on center. So why did I go for the R15? That's because I spray foam. The whole house has spray foam. There's a few factors that go into a relatively energy efficient and, and comfortable home. One is air sealing, air tightedness. Air tightedness? You want your house to, to be tight, not leaky. So you don't want all of your conditions. So it's called conditioned, I don't, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but I think it's called conditioned air when it's in a conditioned space, in the living space of your home. Uh, you can think of it as air conditioned space. So space that you've spent money or energy getting to a comfortable temperature. Uh, so whether you've heated the air, or cooled the air, you've done something to the air to keep it at a temperature that you want, that you like to live in. You like to keep your house at 68 degrees or whatever. If your house is leaky, all that air that you've spent energy getting to the right temperature is just leaking out of your house and other air is leaking in. So if it's really cold outside, then that cold air is leaking in and you're having to heat that air. If it's really hot outside, the hot air is leaking. Anyway, you get the idea. You don't want your house to be leaky. So I've spent a lot of time air sealing the house. I've done a lot of over and above. Some of that is I've used zip sheathing on the outside of the house and then I've taped the seams. I put caulking under everything. I've caulked the bottom plates everywhere. Uh, underneath on the foundation, I ran sill sealer and then two beads of acoustic caulk. Then I've come back and caulked these seams after the fact. I did some crazy uh, flashing around the windows, taped, stretch taped, and then also liquid flashed those. I've got you know new windows, not super high-end windows. So windows is one area that I could have spent more, way more, I could have spent a ton more money on getting just the absolutely best windows. But then the other thing I did was spray foam the whole house. So every wall, uh, the whole ceiling, uh, the rim joists, everything, the, the, you know, everything. It's, there's no, there's no, exterior any wall that hasn't been spray foamed. And spray foam's great insulation. It's got some pros, it's got some cons, but one of the really, one of the pros about it is that it helps seal the house all the way up. So even though I spent all this time with the zip tape and the caulking and all this stuff, spray foam then comes in and it seals everything else. All of the penetrations I sealed before spray foam, but then spray foam comes back and it seals it even more. So it kind of helps 
the structure be a little more rigid, but it also seals it. That's one of the benefits that I want. I want it to be sealed and then adds insulation. So I did two inches of spray foam on the exterior walls. So if you think two inches of spray foam, that essentially turns my open cavity now into the equivalent of a two by four cavity. So that's why I put R15 rock wool into those exterior cavities. So I have the whole five and a half inches of insulation, plus I actually have zip R sheathing on the outside, another half inch, I would just went for the half inch because it, you can basically build the house the same with the half inch. You go bigger, you go inch, two inches or whatever, then that's a lot more work to, you, you gotta change some stuff how you do stuff. Now the best way, Rockwell actually does sell a product called Comfort, Comfort Board, I believe, and that is an exterior insulation product. And that would be the best way to do it. It's more work. I was not familiar building a house that way. Jim and Skylar, the two guys kind of helping me, had never done that. So I just wanted to build the house fast. So the zip bar sheathing, kind of lets you build a house in a traditional way and then I can handle all my insulation on the inside. But they do make a product that just, you can put like two inches of continuous exterior insulation. If I had all the money and time in the world, I probably would have done that route because it is a superior, you don't have thermal breaks, thermal bridging. So a thermal bridging is basically everywhere you have a stud. So this is an exterior wall, this is a two by six stud. This is a thermal bridge. What that means is this stud doesn't have as much R value, as much insulation value as the insulation or the spray foam or the rock wool. So this kind of like is a, it still has R value. You know, people make log cabin homes. This isn't like zero R value, but it has significantly less R value than this. So if you're able to do all of your insulation on the outside of the house, you don't have this thermal bridge anymore for, for to transfer the heat or the cold from outside. I have a little bit of separation, so the whole house does have a, a thermal gap, but more would have been better. But what you get with rock wool, mineral wool insulation, is this doesn't absorb water, it doesn't catch on fire, this is a fire blocking material, and it absorbs sound insanely well. Right now, right now my house is crazy quiet. It's like eerily quiet because I have this on every wall and ceiling and no drywall for it to bounce around. It won't sound like the, I mean, it sounds insane in here right now, just like silence. It's crazy. Uh, one of my other guys can be at the end of the hallway talking to me like straight through here and it sounds like he's 300 feet away because the walls are just absorbing all of that sound. So that's one benefit. You don't hear what's going on on the outside. So I'm, you know, in the mountains on 15 acres. So I don't really have a whole lot. I don't have loud neighbors or a highway or anything nearby. So that doesn't matter as much to me, but right now, well, it's kind of died down, but it's crazy windy outside, but I have not heard any of it because my house is so, quiet and comfortable. Now, one of the other products I've used is safe and sound. Oh, real quick. So R15, comfort bat, uh, comfort board is the exterior stuff. And then I have R38 in the ceilings. So I have spray foam, plus I have R38 in the ceilings. Now I have two layers of R38. So one, it's like an eight inch thick. I think I have a little bit left over here. Yeah, so, so here's your R15. Uh, two by four wall, and then here is your R38 for eight inch inside of the rafters or the joists or whatever you got going on up there. So I have two of those, so it's R, what's 38 plus 38? 76. So out in the garage, I have an R76 ceiling, and I have, actually, I was stupid. I got R15. So I have basically two R15s in the wall. Uh, some places I actually use some extra safe and sound I have. So I don't know exactly what my garage wall assembly is. It's sitting anywhere from R25 to R30 in the walls in the garage. So an R76 and an R30 roughly out in the garage. In the main part of the home, I also have the two layers of R38, plus I think it's uh, like an R20, roughly R21 maybe, 
uh, for the three inches of closed cell spray foam in the ceiling. So I have a nearly R100 roof in the main house, which is way beyond code. It's about double what the code is. So I have a really, really, really insulated lid up there. And again, air sealed. And then in the walls, I believe I have an R30 or so. Uh, that's the R3 continuous exterior, two inches of closed cell foam, and then the R15 rock wool. So I, it's a very insulated home. And yeah, sorry, that's where I got sidetracked. So this has an advertised R value. It's for exterior walls, rock wool, comfort bat, R15. And again, you can get that for all your different stud widths and sizes and everything. And then for your ceiling assembly. And then this is a different product called Safe and Sound. It's really for interior walls. So I have some of this in the 24 inch, some of this in the 16 inch. Uh, I framed most of the basement 24 inch on center. So this is for two by four walls. Most of my interior walls are two by four walls. I have a few that I made thicker, two by six walls, whether they have some plumbing in them. Actually, what, what's one? This is one over here where I have my laundry room. So this is a two by six wall. So the two by six wall, I still just did put in the two by four safe and sound. This wall is kind of crazy. It has my integrated uh, dog gate, basically. You'll see that. I'll show you it later. But I have safe and sound on almost all of the interior walls. I didn't do some, like this is gonna have cabinetry in it and that's just a pantry over there. And so I didn't care about sound proofing this wall as much, but like this has a bathroom on the other side. So if I have someone pooping in there, I don't wanna hear them when I'm making coffee or whatever. And this is the laundry room, so I wanted that all sealed off. The room, the wall between the garage and here is actually completely spray foamed and insulated. So it's very well air sealed between dirty, bad carbon monoxide garage and the rest of the home. So as a detail, I really wanted to do. So that's all sealed off really well. And then basically all the interior walls I did safe and sound because I don't want sound to transfer through the walls either. So did all the walls and then actually up into, into the trusses as well to stop any transfer going up and over. So those are all, all really well insulated. So the safe and sound product is the safe aspect of it is fire can't be in these bays anymore. So you see here a code minimum, any wall over 10 foot needs fire blocking. It needs fire blocking. And the idea of this right here is so fire can't gain a bunch of oxygen and power in this big bay and you need fire stopping at the top. So basically every bay is contained. With the safe and sound, you actually, every fire is just gonna get snuffed out. It's not even gonna be able to grow because there's nowhere for it to go because this is a fire stop. So you basically have, it's impossible for fires to really form in the walls. A normal wall doesn't even have, a lot of interior walls in most homes won't have any insulation in the walls at all. So it's just a big air gap. And so fire can go up in there, but also sound can transfer through. Sound is just a bunch of vibrations and it's hitting a drywall, vibrating and hitting. So this stops those vibrations. So this product is kind of twofold. One, to keep rooms quiet, to have separation. So that way there's bathroom I have separated and then the master bedroom over here. But all of this insulation will help make sound not transfer through as much. Now getting into serious sound proofing and like reducing sound transference, I may do more in this wall. I'm gonna go 5 8 rock, which stops a little more, 5 8 inch drywall, which stops a little more sound transfer. And then I might do two layers. I might use green glue and then put another layer of drywall here. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Maybe that'll be fine and maybe I won't really hear anything. 
there. But for walls that you really, really, really want to reduce sound transfer, there's more you can do. But one of the most important things you can do is to put something like Rockwool's Safe and Sound in between. Basically the best product you can buy for interior walls for, for safety and sound reduction. And then another thing we've done, so some of these are can light sh strings, <laughs> strings, Romex 14-2 hanging down and strapping for this. So these are the floor trusses. These are actually webbed pre-engineered trusses, you know, or floor joists some people have, but I have trusses. So they're open web trusses. You can't see, of them, see any of them anymore because they're all insulated. Another area where fire can happen is in here. So when it's horizontal, you gotta do something called draft stopping. So that way a fire can't start over there and just go zoop all the way through. So a code minimum is every 10 feet, you need a draft stop. Now I have that in every bay. Basically every bay is filled with insulation actually up here. And so fire no longer can move across these either. So fire can't start there and then spread over there. So basically, now fire can't transfer this way, that way, anyway, because of all of the rock wool insulation. The other thing obviously for insulating between levels is that somebody's walking around upstairs or playing music, you don't wanna hear all that down here. So now I have that insulation separating that. This is the back wall, this is the foundation wall. I actually did two, I have, well I did two, two inches. So I did four inches of rigid exterior insulation on this foundation wall. So I have an R, I think it's like an, almost an R20 exterior insulation, plus again, the two inches of spray foam here. These walls, this is just a, it's not a structural wall, but this wall had a gap between the foundation wall, which is behind here, and the two by four stud wall. I don't need any more insulation down here. So that's like a R, R30 or something on my foundation walls that this is all the way below ground. So it's plenty of insulation on the foundation wall. So these are actually empty here. I could have filled them with uh, something, but they're, they're draft stopped here. It's only a eight foot wall stop fire blocked at the top. So this is one area that I could have done more, but it's a concrete wall on the other side and there's not really much going on here. So I decided to save a little bit of money and not put it there. There's no sound coming from that side. There's no fire, there's no danger. There's nothing on that side. So my foundation wall, I just left exterior insulated and spray foam. But now I can't see anything anymore. So I have a bunch of marks on the ground where I basically have can lights or fan boxes or something. Now some of these, the drywallers are gonna cut out when there's boxes, but some of these recessed can lights are just the kind that you cut a hole and you push it up through. So I had to mark all those out and yeah, but now I have an insulated slab, I have an insulated foundation wall, I have a really nicely insulated exterior wall here, and the house is so comfortable. And the idea, you've heard it a bunch if you've watched kind of the, the build series, I designed the home, this is south. So in the winter months when the sun is low, the sun is streaming into the house and just heating things up during the day. Now, if I wanted to do things perfectly, this would be concrete. This would be a thick concrete slab to absorb all of the sun's energy throughout the day and then just hold that in thermal mass. So your house is kind of a battery in, in, some, in some senses, thermal mass. Now, everything has some amount of thermal mass. Sheet rock, basically the more dense a thing is, the more thermal mass it has. Water has a bunch of thermal mass. Concrete has really good thermal mass. Drywall has pretty good thermal mass. Tile has pretty good thermal mass. Wood doesn't have as, as much thermal mass. So in a perfect world, I would have built this house super insulated, which I've done really tightly air sealed, which I've done and would have a ton of thermal mass. Now thermal mass 
it basically regulates the temperature of a building because it takes a lot longer to heat up and a lot longer to cool down. So your house kind of stays even. It doesn't fluctuate as much. When you have a lot of insulation, a lot of thermal mass, your house just wants to stay at the same temperature because you're not losing that heat to the outside or that coolness to the outside. So I, I didn't do a concrete slab here uh, because, you know, I have the basement underneath it. Now I could have gone kind of crazy and done, you know, a lightweight concrete or something, a really supported floor, but it's all too complicated for me. I don't really know what I'm doing. So this isn't gonna have the ideal perfect amount of kind of passive home thermal mass to it. So it'll still be pretty good. Uh, and what's gonna happen basically, sun's gonna come in, sun's gonna heat the house, not gonna run heat ever pretty much if it's sunny outside, even if it's probably, I'm guessing, I'm guessing if it's sunny and it's zero degrees outside, I will still be gaining heat in the house without running uh, my furnace or anything like that because the sun transfers so much heat. Now I have a few systems in place where I'm basically getting all of this heat from the main living room or I have a lot of windows, a lot of windows just on the whole south side. So this is the master bedroom. So this will have a lot of heat. So I wanna get this heat down into the basement because it's gonna get too hot. It's probably gonna get too hot on the main floors, but the sun isn't shining into the basement to heat the basement. So I wanna get all this heated air and suck it down into the basement floor. Now I've added a couple little vents. So I have my normal ductwork for my furnace and air conditioner system. And I've added a couple of vents around the house that are just gonna be controlled by their own inline duct fans. And kind of like I said earlier, a big fan here to shoot air down the hole. And then eventually I'm gonna put a wood burning stove down there. So what the problem I'm trying to solve, not really a problem, but one level of my house is gonna naturally wanna be warmer. I also have a radiant heat, I didn't talk about it, but I have radiant heated floors in the basement. So I have a couple thousand feet of PEX tubing run. So it's gonna be a hydronic radiant system in the floor in the basement. So I could run that in the basement and then the sun is heating it out here, but I also wanna get some of this heat downstairs. And the kind of interesting thing I've been noticing is that, you know, obviously it's kind of working the way that I, I, you know, assumed it would work, but I have, I have some little digital thermostat, thermo things, what are they? They're Govi. These little, these little guys right here. I have a couple of these in the house that are monitoring the temperatures throughout the day. So I can see that my furnace isn't kicking on at all. I don't have a, I don't have a smart thermostat right now. I'm gonna put one in eventually, but I just have a random dumb one to kind of handle things. But I'm noticing that the main level, I have, I have uh, one upstairs and I have one downstairs. The main level heats up during the day and the lower level stays pretty much level. It's not really losing heat or gaining heat, it's staying level. So the main level heats up during the day and then it loses heat a little faster at night. I can track this on, on the graph and the, the basement loses, loses heat slower. And it's because there's big foundation walls, the big concrete slab, there's a lot of thermal mass down there. So it wants to stay at the same temperature. So then eventually, so the main level gets cold enough for the furnace to kick back on. I have it set at 55 right now. So eventually at, I think around midnight maybe, this is kind of, the house just recently got fully insulated. So I've been kind of tracking it since then and it'll, it'll get even a little more, a little more sealed up with the drywall. But basically around midnight, it gets cold enough in the house again now, and you know, it's cold, I live in Colorado. I don't think I've said it in this video. I live in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. Uh, eventually it gets cold enough, you know, when it's 10 degrees outside or whatever, it gets cold enough at around midnight, it seems like, to for the furnace to kick back on, it gets to 55. So it gets to 55 on the main level where the thermostat is. In the basement, it's actually warmer. It's like 58. So the basement hasn't cooled off quite as much because of all that thermal mass. So there's more fluctuations on the main floor than there is in the basement. 
So the idea is when it's heating up a bunch on the main floor, I want to try and get that heat into the basement to, to charge the thermal mass battery that I have in the basement. And so the basement just is very leveled out and I also help level out the main level. So when it's peaking, it's the hottest, if the sun is just streaming in, heating up this house, I want to get a bunch of that heat down down into the basement so it can it can charge that thermal battery kind of. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys or if you care at all. You may not care at all, but I nerd out a little bit. Now I'm not going for any a passive house or any trying to meet any standards or do anything crazy. I will be adding a bunch of solar panels and I think I will be a net zero house eventually. A net zero house means your your house breaks even. Uh, I'm going to go for more than break even. I want to generate more power through solar panels than my house actually uses. So that's called net zero. And there's a bunch of standards and a bunch of hoops you got to try and try and jump through if you want to be like a certified, and I don't really care about any of that crap. So I'm going to have solar panels and I have a super energy efficient home and I'm going to basically try to break even or do better than break even. I'm going to have a whole whole battery backup, solar array, all that stuff. I'm still kind of figuring out all that. That's just going to be stuff I do after the house is built just because I didn't have enough energy or knowledge or insight to try and do that during the process. I'm just trying to get this house built. And how that kind of, the reason I'm doing that is, well, I just, you know, it's going to be cheaper to to run my house basically, but also the prepper side of me. If you guys follow my channel for things other than home building, which most of you do, it's like gear, preparedness. I mean, a lot of you follow me for overlanding and trucks and whatnot, but at the core, at the foundation of who I am and my channel is really about preparation. And I'm actually building this whole thing out. Uh, I'm gonna build a homestead. So I'm gonna have an orchard and I'm gonna grow food and I'm gonna, so crazy, there's a helicopter flying by and I can just barely hear it, but it's like right there. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's cool to, it's cool to see the insulation at play. Uh, what was I saying? Preparedness. So we're going to build a homestead and everything like that. So one of the things, you know, if you know, apocalyptic, I don't really, I don't really prepare for the apocalypse in mind, but you know, it's in the back of any prepper's head. If I have no energy, Technically, I'll have my own energy plant with solar panels and battery and everything. But if I don't have any energy, I'm going to have the wood-burning stove again. Uh, but if I don't have any energy, the home theoretically will be comfortable all winter long. Uh, and the thing that I talked about earlier is I have these these overhangs in the front. So in the summer, the sun is higher in the sky. So with all of my roof insulation up here, the the heat from the sun won't get into my home. It'll be shaded the whole time. So it won't get very hot in the summer. And then all the sun coming in in the winter will keep it comfortable in the winter as well. So what that means is grid down, no energy, whatever. This home is going to kind of just be comfortable still. I'm going to be freezing myself out. So these were all aspects that I built into the home that make sense to me. And why did I start, oh, if this, if this kind of crap interests you at all. Those are kind of all of the angles that I took when, when designing and kind of figuring out uh, safety in mind. I do have a whole sprinkler system that was required. Uh, I, I, live in, in, I live in the mountains. You got to do some special requirements based on your, your fire department if they deem it. If the king deems it, I was required to put a fire sprinkler system. So this house is never going to burn down. But even without the fire sprinkler system, now all of the rock wool and everything, the exterior of the home is hardy. I need to do a bunch of stuff to basically make it so my house can't burn down. And so what all? What does that all mean? It means I live in a very safe and a very comfortable house. My family... I will not have to worry about A, them screaming and hearing them through the walls, but also a fire ripping through here and just destroying everything super easily. So the house that I've built to live in, to grow in, to, to raise a family in is coming together 
nicely. And I just, you know, wanted to share the build with you for in case you, you want to do something like this in the future. Maybe you can learn a few things from, from the hundreds, thousands of hours of, of kind of research and thought that I've put into this. Now, it's not a perfect home. There's actually a handful of things that I would have done differently at this point now, now that the house is basically built. But it's been good. I think towards the end, uh, maybe at the end, maybe when I'm done building the house, I'll do kinds of, you know, things I would have done differently or things I wish I knew sooner or whatever. But it's really, it's taking shape surprisingly well. Like the house is coming together and I'm not walking around and being like, oh, I wish I did that. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I it's actually, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. So yeah, insulation, energy, safety, all of that stuff. That was kind of this video. Eh, maybe a little more boring than some of my other build type videos, but I hope you enjoyed it. Next time you see a video, the house is going to look a lot different. It's going to look a lot different, but let me know what you want to see down below. Uh, I said that in the previous video as well, but I like hearing from you guys to see what, what you're interested in, what you want to see, that kind of stuff. So let me know. Thanks for watching. Thanks for commenting, thumbs upping, getting subscribed. Yeah. Until next time, guys. Take care.